Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Uh, I've been around for a few weeks, so you may have seen me around. I've met many of you and been able to get to know a few of you. Uh, I've also enjoyed some of these worship and prayer times with you as well, so um, it's great to have the opportunity to contribute to this service for the first time uh, while I'm here, hopefully the first of many. The message that um, I want to be to share with you basically comes down to this. I believe that if we have faith in how God cares for us, we can be free from this anxiety that often comes over how we look and how other people think about us. And we can, <coughs> excuse me, we can enter into a life that effortlessly, effortlessly reflects God's beauty without worrying about the impression we're making on people around us. So before we get to that, before we get to the verses that I think share that message with us, I want to give some context. We're going to be looking at a couple of verses in what's commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. So if you haven't heard of it, it's three chapters in Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The sermon is just a speech with some kind of religious teaching. And so all of these three chapters is just one sermon. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount because in the beginning in chapter 5, it says that Jesus went on a mountain and it was on a mountain where he gave this sermon. And this is quite a well-known passage because I think it really gets to the core of what it means or what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. There's a lot of what we see in the Gospels, these Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four firsthand accounts of who Jesus is and what he did. A lot of it talks about the miracles that Jesus did naturally because these were really astounding and they really set Jesus as part as something more than just another wise teacher. A lot of it talks about parables that Jesus gave and interactions with the Jewish leaders and local religious authorities and his critique of their hypocrisy and their legalism. And we also get a lot of stories of Jesus calling people to follow him, to change, his, change their life, to believe in him. But if we ask the question, like, what does that really mean? Like, all of this following Jesus, what is, like, let's get down to some details here. What does that look like? I think the best place to go for that is these three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And they're good for really anybody. Maybe at this point you're still something of an outsider in terms of who Jesus is, and you're wondering, you know, it's cool to have him around, but do I really want to commit my life to living the way he wants me to live? Well, this chapter is a good place to go to look at it and say, well, what would a life with Jesus look like? This, is, this gives you a picture of what that life is like. Or maybe you've been in church your whole life, and now it's kind of becoming routine to you, and you're wondering, you know, is all this stuff I'm doing really what, what, Jesus, excuse me, what Jesus has for me? And coming back to these chapters is great for that as well, to sort of reset your track and say, well, Jesus, show me, is there anything in these teachings that I've been neglecting or haven't been following? As you can imagine, this three chapters of a sermon on how to live your life the way Jesus wants you to live your life is quite abstract. There's a lot of metaphors in there and a lot of, um, a lot of things that are meant to make you think more than they are to give you simple explanations. And we'll see that as we look through a few chapters today. The, a few verses today, excuse me. So the verses that we'll look at are in a section on worry. And they come from Matthew 6. And we're just going to look at verses 28 through 30. And these verses say, And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So Jesus, as we come to your words, we just pray that you would give us hearts and minds to be able to understand what you want to teach us from these words, that we'd be able to see through all of the metaphors and things that you uh, are using to teach us, that we'd be able to apply it to our own lives, that we might learn what it's like to follow you and be ready to receive the grace that you want to give us to be more like you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So I, I read these verses years ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and I remember being struck by something about these verses, a particular interpretation. Thank you. And I was really thought it was quite interesting, quite impressive until recently I was thinking about these verses again, and I thought, well, actually my first interpretation was probably not completely right. So I want to give you 
my first interpretation of what I thought these verses meant, and then explain why I think that wasn't the best interpretation, and then try to get into a little bit of a deeper trying to dig out what Jesus was really saying in these verses. So the verse basically compares some flowers with the clothes of King Solomon. And we don't know exactly what kind of flowers Jesus was thinking of. We don't have like, any kind of precise scientific name. But we, we can kind of get a pretty good guess um, at what they might have been. So we can, clearly these are wild flowers. They're just growing in a field somewhere. These aren't like special cultivated flowers. And it's a pretty good reason for thinking that it might have been this particular kind of flower, the Antimis palestina, because this flower grows at the end of long grasses that are like stems or a small shrub. And it's thought that people use this flower or use the grass that this flower grows on as a source of fuel. So that makes sense out of the part where Jesus says these flowers were thrown into the fire in these verse. So Jesus is talking about some kind of flowers that grow on grass out in the field that people harvest and would use as a secondary source of fuel when there wasn't enough wood or other sources of fuel. Now he wants to compare these flowers with the clothing of Solomon. Now Solomon was the third king of Israel, and he was the king of Israel at the time when the kingdom was at its most powerful and richest. He was the king that oversaw the building of the first temple, and so he sat over a huge amount of wealth that the, that the country had amassed and saved up for the building of this temple. He's well known for being extremely extraordinary rich and quite extravagant. And so what Jesus is saying is to the Jews that he's speaking to, think of the richest and most powerful person that you have ever known in these lands who on top of that was a monarch, right? So he's a politician. He has to sort of show who he is all the time. There's a lot of pageantry involved. And think of how he dressed. So these are the two things that we're comparing. We're comparing these flowers that grow in a field that no one really notices because they're just on this grass that we use for fuel with the clothing of the most powerful man in the land trying to show off all of his riches and power. And what Jesus says strikes me as intuitively wrong. He says that the flowers are more beautiful than Solomon's clothes. And presumably anyone who would have been listening to Jesus say this would have stopped and said, are you sure that's what you think? Like, sure, we all appreciate flowers, but like imagine you walk into a room and you see some of these flowers in a vase, but also in the same room is this king dressed up in all of his kingly clothes, all of his outfits. Like, which one are you going to notice? Which one are you going to look at? you're clearly going to be more impressed by the king's clothing. There's something intuitively backwards about what Jesus is saying that strikes us as just wrong. It doesn't seem like the way we operate, the way we think. And so my first interpretation of this was that basically Jesus is trying to say that our problem is that we don't appreciate the beauty of nature enough, that we need to look at God's creation and appreciate its beauty more than these man-made, maybe superficial things. And that was where I, where I thought Jesus was going with this verse, that we need to be, we simply need to slow down and look at nature. And for me, as somebody growing up in a city my whole life, that's probably true. I probably do need to slow down, learn to appreciate nature, not always just go for the easy entertainment, but take the time to invest in seeing what's around me in creation and enjoying that. I think that's a good thing. I think that's something we could probably all learn to and grow at and improve on. But I don't think that's Jesus' point. So here's why I don't think that's Jesus' point. This whole example is supposed to help us with this question of worrying about our clothing. And how does appreciate flowers, how appreciating flowers help us not to worry about what we wear? How does that help us? Because I think it's pretty simple. To, there's people who can appreciate flowers but also are really anxious about their clothes, right? These things are not mutually exclusive. That's, not, that's too simple of an explanation for what Jesus is doing here. I don't think it answers the question. So in order to get out what I think Jesus is saying, I want us to dig a little bit deeper into this question of what does it mean to worry about clothes? What is the problem that Jesus is trying to address? Then get back into how is this comparison between flowers and Solomon supposed to help us with this problem that Jesus is addressing. So the problem that he wants to address is worrying about clothes, anxiety about what we wear. Now, 
our worry about clothes, unlike, say, maybe worrying about uh, food, another example that Jesus uses earlier, worrying about clothes normally isn't going to be a worry about quantity of material. Everybody you know has clothes. That the poorest person you know has some kind of clothes. So the kind of anxiety that comes from a clothes comes from our, our, what we wear isn't really just anxiety about possessions or about having enough. It's an anxiety about having the right kind of clothes. And those right kind of clothes are normally determined by what we think other people expect of us. And are we wearing good enough clothes that people will make fun of us, that people will think we're cool, that we'll fit in, that we'll look professional? Whatever it is for you in your life, we all face some kind of pressure. We all think that people want us to look a certain way, and we feel this pressure to meet that expectation. And that pressure, if not managed well, can turn into anxiety. Anxiety can create a lot of problems in our life because it can push us to spend money that we don't have or shouldn't be spending. It can push us to expend energy or use our time in ways that aren't wise. It can keep us from being able to look around and help other people because we're so concerned about our own perceived needs and things that we're trying to get done or these expectations we're trying to meet. And I think anxiety is also symptomatic of a deeper problem that when we're anxious, it also points to some kind of lack of peace in our hearts, something deeper going on. And maybe for you, clothes isn't really the issue, whatever it is in you know, your life, clothing just isn't a big thing, but maybe there's other things that are slightly similar for you. Maybe it's something slightly different, like your shoes or your hairstyle. Maybe for you, you are worried about having the right kind of car to impress your friends. Maybe you're worried about getting into the right kind of school so that people think you're smart. <coughs> maybe you're worried about what your Instagram looks like, that everyone thinks on social media, you really got it together, you're, you're really trendy and hip. Hip is probably not the right word to use if I'm trying to be cool. So back, back to the question. Whatever, whatever it is for you, I'll stick to clothes because that's Jesus' example here, but um, the question is, how does comparing flowers and Solomon help us with this anxiety over wanting to impress people with how we dress? So I think the key comes not just in the comparison, but in what Jesus says specifically about the flowers. What is the comment that he makes about these flowers? He says, consider the lilies of the field. And then he tells us what it is about them that we should consider. He says, they don't work or make their clothing. Okay, so these flowers, he's saying, consider their beauty. This is a beauty that comes without effort. They haven't push hard or stress themselves out over trying to be beautiful. And he compares this with Solomon. How much effort do you think went into Solomon's clothes when he was trying to impress people? There was a huge amount of effort that went into the kind of beauty that Solomon wanted to display. It wasn't at all effortless or natural. So I think that's the comparison that Jesus wants us to get at. Why was there so much effort in Solomon's clothes? Why would so many people have put in so many hours and spent so much money in getting Solomon to look as impressive as possible? Well, presumably, he needed to, you know, assert and establish that he was the richest and most powerful guy around. This was a political tool. He needed to portray himself as something almost, you know, superhuman, something a little bit better than everybody else, so that people would have some awe and respect for him. So for Solomon, the beauty that he had was a means to an end. It was a tool that he was using for some social purpose that he was trying to achieve, trying to establish his status in that society. In contrast, the beauty of the flowers has nothing to do with social status, has nothing to do with impressing anybody. It doesn't require any effort or stress. So I think what Jesus is giving us is a contrast between two ways of showing and reflecting beauty. And for one way, he uses the example of the flower, and the other way, the example of Solomon's clothing. These flowers reflect God's beauty. That's what they're there for. They're just a reflection of the beauty of God. They have no other ulterior motive. There's no other greater purpose to these flowers except to be a natural reflection of who the Creator is. In contrast, 
Solomon's clothing are a reflection of his status. They're not designed to honor God. They're not designed to show how good or great God is or what, who he is as a creator, his creativity and design or his provision. They're designed to show how strong Solomon is as the leader of this nation and in turn how great and powerful this nation is. The beauty of the flower is the kind of beauty that doesn't have to be noticed by anybody. It can be there and it's beautiful on its own. God sees it. And it doesn't need any other purpose. It doesn't need to be noticed. It's an end in itself because it glorifies God whether anyone looks at it or not. In contrast, Solomon's beauty is the kind of beauty that has to be noticed. If it's not noticed, it doesn't serve its purpose. And in addition, it can't take any criticism because its purpose is to impress people. And if people are criticizing it, it's not impressing them and it's no longer serving its purpose. So it's the kind of beauty that depends on people liking it. It requires some kind of positive response from people in order to function in the way it's designed to function. I think furthermore, the kind of beauty that Jesus is using this flower to represent is the beauty that comes from a deep faith in God's care for us. This is because at the end of the verse, Jesus tells us God will care for us and then admonishes us to say, why do you have so little faith? In other words, the issue, the the solution to this problem of anxiety over what we look like is to have faith. Faith specifically in how God provides and cares for us, just like he cares for these flowers and makes them beautiful. And so we, the flowers represent a beauty that flows from this kind of faith and results in a freedom to express that beauty as God provides. Whereas the beauty of Solomon in his clothes It's motivated by this desire to impress other people, and it's going to result in a constant anxiety over what people think. It has to, by its nature, always be concerned with what other people think, because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to impress people. So if this is what Jesus has to say to us about these two kind of beauties, I just want to think about two ways that we might react to what Jesus is saying. One way, one reaction might be to say, okay, well, maybe I care a little bit too much about how I dress or what I do or whatever about my clothes and my appearance. So in order to be more spiritual, I should wear ugly clothes. I should, you know, stop caring about how I look. Then, like, that will be be more spiritual. So there's an obvious danger with that, right? Because first... If you're wearing ugly clothes in order to show people that you're spiritual, you're still trying to impress people with your clothes. And this is still the same cycle, right? You haven't really fixed your problem. The real issue here, though, is the issue of your motivation. I don't think Jesus is that concerned with setting a list of rules of what is and isn't okay to wear, what you can and can't spend on your clothes, how much time you can and can't spend getting yourself in a way that you feel comfortable and presentable for whatever context you're in. The issue is, what is the motivation behind all of this? What's pushing you? What gets you up in the morning? What gets you wanting to dress in a certain way and look in a certain way? What's going on in your heart? And like so many of the other issues that Jesus discusses in the Sermon on the Mount, it comes back down to a question of really what's motivating us? What's in our heart? Why are we doing these things? And Jesus, I think, is happy for you to be beautiful. In fact, he says about these flowers, not that they're admirable because they're average looking. He says these flowers are to be looked at and considered because they are beautiful. So I think beauty is a great thing to look for, to search for, to want to obtain. But it must come from a faith in God's provision for you and a natural overflow of your appreciation for all beauty, however is expressed in the world. People who can appreciate all beauty as a reflection of who God is are just as happy to see themselves in a great outfit as they are to see their friend in a great-looking outfit, as they are to see their enemy in a great-looking outfit, because it's not a question of trying to one-up each other, trying to be better than each other. It's a question of each person expressing their unique beauty in their own way. And when you can appreciate that beauty and see it as a reflection of who God is, You're no longer concerned about, well, who has the best, who has the coolest, who has the nicest and the newest, but you're happy to see each person 
expressing the beauty God gave them with their own creativity, with their own means that God gave them in their own particular way. Some of you might also be thinking, well, none of this really applies to me because I don't really care how I dress. This is not an issue for me. I'm not that superficial like all these other people. I don't have to worry about it. So to that group, I would first question, what is it that's motivating this uh, posture of indifference towards how you look or how you dress? Because there's two ways to respond to social pressure. We all have the social pressure to look a certain way in some context. And one response might be to try really hard to meet that pressure, whatever the cost. But the other response might be to run away and push all those things away. And that might seem easier and simpler for you to do it that way, but you're still having a negative response to this social pressure. And you're still not reflecting the beauty that God gave you. You're trying to suppress something. You're trying to avoid the pressure, avoid by acting like you're too good to want to have to impress other people. I don't think not caring is a good answer to this, those kinds of pressures about how we look because I think this verse tells us pretty directly that God cares about how we look. It says that God cares about how the flowers look in a field. And then it says, how much more does God care about how you look? So I think sometimes it's easier to think about it this way, to think about this grass somewhere in some field and to think, yeah, that grass is God's creation. And so God cares about giving it beautiful flowers because that's a reflection of who he is. And we can all see and appreciate and enjoy that beauty. But if that's how God thinks about that grass in that field, how, do God, how does God think about you who are sitting here? You who are created in his image, you who are a reflection of his beauty, you who are the pinnacle of his creation. So if God is willing to give these flowers that beauty that's to be appreciated and enjoyed, how much more will he give you a beauty to reflect in your own unique way in this world. So I think we're all called to reflect God's beauty in our own way. To do it not out of a desire to impress people, not out of a fear that people won't like us, but to do it in appreciation for who God is, for his creativity, appreciation for what he's given us, and to freely express that as an expression of our gratitude, of our love for this God who's given us everything we have. And so why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So Jesus, we thank you for these words. We ask you to forgive us when we have given in to anxiety about how we looked, when we've given in to fear of what people will think about us, where we've done things that may have been irresponsible or unwise or unloving in order to try to one-up other people and impress other people with how we look or who we are or what we have. We ask that you would give us a deeper faith in your provision for us in every area of our lives. And that you'd also open our eyes to see the world as you see it, to see the beauty in this world as a reflection of who you are, whether it's in nature, whether it's in our friends, or whether it's in ourselves and we look in the mirror, that we'd be able to see the beauty you've given us and appreciate who you are in that beauty. Lord, we pray that we would be able to honor and glorify you in how we dress and how we treat each other and how we treat people who are dressed differently than us and that the way we live our lives would not be determined by anxiety but would be an overflow of love for you coming from faith and how you care for us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.